places. You've been given a Pharisaic model that says this is Satan and this acts of grace. Well now, we are going to get straight back into the book and start thinking some more about what Luke, how Luke frames this book for us. You remember, weren't you, that in the first verse, Luke had said uh, to Theophilus, who's the person who Luke is writing to, I began to tell you in my first book, Luke says, about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And we've been thinking in these first few weeks about precisely what it was that Jesus began to do and to teach and why he would use such a word as began. And we began to see from that that actually that the book of Luke is all about what Jesus did for men. But now we're going to see in the book of Acts what he's doing through men. And this is really very, very important. But notice when you hear in the, uh, the as this verse, uh, this chapter opens up, Luke writes, um, that Jesus, all that Jesus began to do and to teach, verse 2, until the day that he was taken up and after he gave commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. And do you remember last time we started to think about those apostles and the group that was called together? Uh, and he gives this really interesting statement in the third verse. He says, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them for 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Well now, we started to think some about that and I want just to make sure we've really got that clear in our minds before we leap on into the, into the, kind of, into the Pentecost scene and begin to sort of start smelling the, the, you know, really the, 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 verified, the verified atmosphere of Acts because we're going to make, have to make sure we kind of bank a couple of things before we move on. Um, if you've listened to my teaching over any period of time, you'll know that I think very much in terms of these phases of the Christian life, the, the child, the young man, and the father. Well, I think that those phases also represent not simply just those maturing points, those kind of key milestones, but I think they also talk to us about our death, our resurrection, and our ascended life. So the first phase is, our, is, 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 if you will, death to the old. The second phase, what I would call the teenage phase, is recognizing the ascended life. And the third crucial phase is about our ascended life. Now, it says to us in Acts that for 40 long days, Jesus appeared to them, telling them about the kingdom of God. Now, I greatly suspect, in order that for, for this group to be able to move into this new covenant proposition, in order for them to be able to understand what it would mean to live as a new covenant people, the first and most needful thing that Jesus is going to have to do is he's going to have to be able to move this core group of people from this business of understanding that the kingdom of heaven is somewhere on the outside and to begin to understand, in fact, that the kingdom of heaven is within. And actually, the, the, the mystery that is the revelation that the kingdom of heaven is within is a profound truth. And, and by no means is this, is this a child truth. This is a very mature truth. Um, and, and the disciples begin to ask questions about, Lord, is the, are you about to restore the kingdom to Israel at these times? You see, Unfortunately, their, their mind was still locked in to a very temporal paradigm. They were thinking still very much about the external world. They were thinking about earthly kingdoms. And his response to them was very interesting. Remember verse 7. He said to them, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you, crucially watch, you will receive power. And this is a very interesting statement. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, the Bible says, as he went, behold, two men stood in white robes and said to him, Men of Galilee, why are you standing looking into heaven? The Jesus who was taken up into heaven will come down the same way you saw him go up into heaven. Now, I think this is really exciting because it feels to me immediately like there is this beautiful prophetic context that's been set for us. Because one can't help feel, one can't help remember some, or hear, if you will, something of an echo of the book of Second Kings. And I'm thinking now about the spirit of Elijah. I'm thinking about that wonderful moment where Elisha 
who is the apprentice to Elijah, pursues Elijah to the place where he's taken up. And Elijah says, if you see me when I go up, and there is this nice sense about uh, when Elijah ascended, his mantle literally fell from him, and the mantle fell upon Elisha. And the amazing story about Elijah and Elisha is that Elisha, <laughs> it's confusing, isn't it? Elisha did double the amount of miracles that Elijah did. Interestingly enough, he says, you know, the, he, he will need a double portion because you know he would not be able, doesn't feel in his own strength, he'd be able to combat the woman Jezebel. And fascinatingly, there are 16, I think, miracles that are performed by Elijah. And poor Elisha dies after his 31st miracle. And you think, oh, that's a toy, why not go for one more? But then Elijah, the, the body of Elijah, is it, he's, someone was laying on his tomb or something of that nature. Anyway, someone is laid across the dead body of Elijah and they come back to life. And that's Elisha's 32nd miracle, which is really interesting. Um, so part of the story, what makes this story so interesting though, is this, whereas you had with um, Elisha, this pursuance, this very clear sense of destiny, this very clear sense that if he could just be with Elijah, when Elijah passed on into the, into the, into the beyond, moved across into the unseen, if he could just be with him, that would be a defining moment. Whereas this group is still rather naive. They, they, they're, they're not sure really of what's happening. In fact, they're very confused. They're very bewildered. Um, but, there, but there are three questions that I think we are going to have to answer that are the three points that Jesus raises to them and I'm sure must have taxed their minds. Number one, why must they wait? Jesus says, now wait in Jerusalem. Why must they wait, number one? Uh, two, why do they need power? That's an interesting question. And three, why must they go first to Jerusalem? So why must they wait? Very valid question. Why on earth do they need power? And why do they need to begin this mission? Why does it have to begin in Jerusalem? Well, let me ask, ask a question, question three first. Because question three is, an, is a very interesting one. Uh, for us at the Grace Project, I feel that this question is perhaps the most, the most simple for us to answer. And we can then kind of work our way backwards. You see, I would say this to you. If you want to change the way the world perceives God, then it's necessary for us to, well, let me rephrase that. If you want to change the way the world perceives Christianity, let's come right down to it, then you will have to change the way that Christians perceive God. Because currently, the Christian projection of God is not a projection of God that I think is attractive to anybody. Um, frankly, I just the more I begin to understand about the nature of God, or let's, let's put it this way, the more I become aware and recognize that God is love, the, 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 the more incongruous the whole nature of Christianity seems to be, and the more incongruous the whole nature of any religion seems to be. Because it seems to me that religion has at its heart this ability or this desire, uh, this, its roots are around separation. But I don't see separation in the nature of God. I see union in the nature of God. I see inclusion in the nature of God. I don't see division. I see oneness. I, I see community. I see a unity in the spirit. And so it feels very much to me if they're going to go to the ends of the earth and they're going to take this gospel to the ends of the earth and they're going to be witnesses in this gospel to the ends of the earth, then it seems to me that the very first thing that must happen is that the gospel must go to Jerusalem. And I'll tell you why. Because, you see, we must first go to Jerusalem. We must first, well, if you will, preach the gospel to the saved because the saved are the ones that are really going out and gossiping the gospel. And so it's most important that the, that the, that the mission that be begins at the front door of the church. That's very important because we can't have a discontinuous message. We can't have a disconnected message. The, the message of grace and freedom and inclusion and love and wholeness and oneness. You should be able to run to a church and find nothing but hope and healing for you instead of judgment and condemnation. But let's, let's not overplay that because that's not really the main point. The, 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 the interesting thing is that this book is going to tell the story about two church planters. Peter, who's the church planter, if you will, the apostle to the circumcised or to the Jews. And then we'll have Paul's story and he's the apostle to the uncircumcised. 
And one of the things that's going to strike you as very stark is the difference between the reception of the gospel amongst the Jews as it is amongst the Gentiles. In fact, it seems the further away you go from the church, the more likely you are to have people receiving this message of grace and receiving it uncritically and just embracing it for all it is. But the closer you are to church, the more ingrained you are in church life, the less likely it is that anyone is going to receive, receive it without real serious difficulty. Because you see, they've already received something else. They've already received the world of, of legalism, of rules, of laws. And the perception they have of God is so warped and so twisted that to overlay that with a message of love uh, raises the accusation that you're either you're some kind of licentious preacher, you're some kind of pe teaching immoral immorality and teaching people to sin and all the rest of it. But it's so counterintuitive to the religious mind to teach the nature of grace. Uh, but the reality is, in this book, this book is all about what happens to a group of people who are living under grace. They're not living under law, remember. They're living under grace. And one of the great struggles, one of the great puzzles we're going to see is that Jesus was a man who lived by grace under the law. But now we have a group of people who for the very first time can say they live under grace but still choose to live under the law. And it's a very perplexing problem. And so this message must come and it has to come with power. And it must come with power for this reason. And that's because we are, we're, not, we're grace immigrants, you see. We're not grace natives. We don't uh, take to this message if you like, naturally in our minds or naturally in our flesh. Oh, it's natural in our spiritual man, but the, the light of God, the, 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 the light of Christ within us has to shine brightly before we can really begin to see this is nature to us. Uh, it's very interesting to me that when we talk about this message and when we start sharing this message with people, people often say to me, oh, gosh, yes, I often wondered about that, but I was never sure. And, and, and you, as you begin to unpack it, people begin to, something resonates within them because it's, it's, not, it's, it's something that the light of Christ that is within is beginning to, to witness that this is the truth. And the darkness, may I say, that is religion and legalism cannot and must not overcome it. But it, but it requires a power, and, and nobody in the, in, the, in the disciple team would have needed any convincing that they needed power to evidence the message, because the reality for them was that Thomas, who was one of their own, who even knew Jesus, when he come and met, came amongst them after Jesus had appeared from the dead, he was so unimpressed by the evidence of their lives that he refused to believe that Jesus was alive unless he saw him for himself. So this is really very important. So as I say, we are, we, we're, we're dealing with grace immigrants. We're not dealing with grace natives. We are, for most of us, asylum seekers from religion, if you like. Um, now, so this book becomes really, really, really important. And the scripture says that he appeared to them for 40 days. And as we'll see in our next installment, next time out, we'll see that 40 is a crucial number because 40 is the number of preparation. We'll see, won't we, that uh, we'll remember surely that the, the, the earth was flooded in Noah's day for 40 days. We'll remember, won't we, that it took 40 days uh, for Moses when he was up in the mountain at Mount Sinai to receive the law. That took 40 days for him to receive that. It took 40 years for Israel to complete its wandering through the wilderness and coming into the promised land and their inheritance. Uh, Jesus endured the temptation for 40 days in the wilderness. And now we're going to see that it will take 40 days, 40 days of being visited by the resurrected Christ, the Jesus Christ, not the one they've known who walked and talked with them as the carpenter's son, but as the resurrected, ascended Messiah. It would take them 40 days to be convinced that this, this was something that was going to stick, this was something that was going to be new, this was something that was going to be hold. Because you see, it was one thing under the old covenant when Jesus was alive, if you like, after the flesh, to be able to say that Christ was with us. But now, my friends, we're moving into something radical. Now we're moving into something that has been there ever since the dawn of man. But now we're going to come to come into the realization, into the fullness of it, that it's not simply us saying that Christ is with us. It's not even saying Christ is for us. Now we're going to say Christ is in us. And not only is Christ in us, Christ is as us. I tell you something, it's one thing to say that you're in Christ, 
But my goodness, what a different thing it is to say that Christ is in you. Well, next week we'll pick this theme up and we'll see if we can push into this a bit further. But this really is going to be the advent of the new covenant. Christ in you. It's the hope of glory. Look forward to being with you next time. In the meantime, have a great week. God bless. Bye-bye.